Hey everybody, welcome to Health Hackers episode 20. I'm Gemma Evans, I'm a journalist and presenter here in the UK. And this is my series devoted to getting inside the minds of pioneering figures in health and wellness. If you are watching this episode live on Facebook, hello, and you can see who my guest is today. If you're listening to the podcast, it's Dale Pinnock, AKA the medicinal chef. Dale is with us for the next 30 minutes. That means you can ask him anything you like. We're gonna be talking all things healthy eating. Dale knows a thing or two about this because he's written 14 books. He's got a degree in nutrition and a postgrad in nutritional medicine. He's also a chef, which means he knows how to make healthy food taste really, really good. So we're gonna be talking about all this kind of stuff. If you can think of someone who should watch this video, tag them in the comment section below this video now. I'm having a look at all your comments and questions and I can put them to Dale as we go. But to begin with, I guess Dale, for the sake of the podcast and a nice little introduction, let's talk about your backstory because you've done so much, so many things. I don't One know how we're gonna <laughs> get through it all in 30 minutes. But how did, you, how did you end up on this journey, it sounds cliche, but on this journey to becoming the celebrity chef that you are now? I realised the other day I've actually been doing this for 25 years, which kind of scared me a little bit. Um, it's, it was quite a long and convoluted journey. I think like everyone else, I found nutrition and wellness through my own health challenges. And it was the age of about 10 or 11. It was the summer of leaving primary school to go to secondary school. That time in your life when you just start to become conscious of yourself in relation to your peers. And I started breaking out with acne. And it was Eleven. there. At yes, 11. yes, wow. yeah, I was an early okay. starter and usually, because I, I, I sort of hit puberty very, very early and like the first year of, of secondary school, I was towering above everyone. By the end of the second year, I was, I was like Frodo Baggins and they all kind of <laughs> carried on, but like, I, I had this massive growth spurt and when you tend to start getting these skin issues very, very early, they tend to last quite a long time into sort of teenage years and into the 20s, really? which was the case with me. Went to see many types of practitioners, doctors and dermatologists, had all the usual lotions and potions, topical antibiotics, oral antibiotics, vitamin A preparations. Nothing really made a massive difference. Got to the age of about 15, I was sat around at the, uh, my friend's house, feeling a bit sorry for myself, moping about the situation. And his friend's mum lent me a book, and it was a book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. I don't know if you've ever come no, across no. that. I mean, you read it now, and it's a little bit far-fetched, but back then it was my <laughs> first exposure to the fact that food potentially can be part of the therapeutic picture. And I read this thing cover to cover in a weekend and that was the light bulb moment that we can actively engage in our own healthcare and that started. That's quite proactive for a 15 year old kid, isn't it? Honestly, I was so miserable if someone would have told me to like go outside wrapped in tinfoil at midnight and do a cartwheel and it would have yeah. made a difference, I would have tried it. Yeah, no, um, I used to walk around, literally, I mean, probably most of the people in the village thought I was going to lynch them, so I used to walk around with a scarf up like this, because oh. uh, I didn't want anyone to see my face, I'd yeah. never sort of sit under strip lighting or anything like that, because it would really highlight the fact yeah. that, that I had the skin issues. So when it's kind of been grinding away for that long, anything that was sort of presented to mm. you, you're ready to try. Plus I've always been an enthusiastic eater. I've always cooked. That's so a great it, way of putting it. Yeah. Enthusiastic eater. Yeah. Oh my god, That's I'm a one of those. Other words, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I eat a lot. I'm an enthusiastic eater. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I can really sympathise with that. I've had awful skin issues and I can totally sympathise with the lighting and, and not yeah, wanting to Yeah, it's when it's on up. your face. I mean, you know, no yeah. one cares if you've got a spotty bum, but I mean, when it's on your <laughs> face and like, it's displayed to the world, it, it just eats it away really at you, is, it yeah, really does. Yeah. Oh, I know. So how did you become known as the medicinal chef? Where did the name come from? That's what I branded myself. You just came, yeah. just like, I mean, oh, I I came up with that in, it was about 98, I think, 98, okay. 99. And Food was obviously, I, I do view food as medicine. I mean, I don't approach any of this like sort of wishy-washy and hippy-dippy, it's none of that kind of stuff. It's evidence-based, it's quite reductionist, but food is part of the therapeutic picture and mm -hmm. food can be seen as a, a, a medicine. Yeah, really. So yeah. it was just a name that pops into my head. And I thought it's quite a good one, so, so I branded well, it. No, I, I like it. So back in 1998, now, I remember 1998 really well because that was um, when I was having issues with food mm. and, and for the first time I was taken to see a nutritionist, I was having panic attacks and anxiety and a nutritionist linked it to a drop in low blood sugar, a feeling really an anxious mm -hmm. and so my, the advice I was given was to quit sugar and, mm -hmm. and like you I was in this desperate state, I really wanted to stop having anxiety and I couldn't understand it and then I was being told that food could really help me but it was at a time where 
this wasn't talked about. Yeah. I mean, I was, I must have been the only girl in my school who was uh, bringing like protein shakes yeah. as a snack in break time. And in, in 1998, this was just unheard. See, 1998, that was that was quite far down the path. You tried doing this in '92. That was interesting. <laughs> wow. um, but but yeah, it, it it is something. I mean, obviously nowadays it's it's gained popularity massively. Yeah. I've always seen this day coming. Really? Like where we're at now, I've always seen it coming. But it was much harder to make better choices back then, wasn't it? Oh yeah, it oh, was much massively. harder. And now I look back on those choices that I was taught were really good choices, and I don't think they were. <laughs> but yeah. it's it's all just changed so much. Um. So like bringing it to present day now, think about the way we are, the way we eat, the way most people eat. Okay, mm. so outside of your really healthy circle. Um, <laughs> what's your biggest worry when you look at how society, why does society are eating or maybe being sold certain foods? What, what gets your back up the most? Being sold the idea of convenience. Convenience. A lot, yeah, a lot of the things that, that you find, the, the, the highly processed ready meals, they're, they're sold to us under the guise of convenience and you look at some of the advertising campaigns and they very much prey on it. People have anxieties about their income, they have anxieties about not having enough, enough time for themselves or their families and marketers prey on that and that's, that's quite nefarious I think really because it's, it's, it's targeting our, 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 our deepest anxieties mm -hmm. and manipulating those just to sell us some rubbish. Is there any convenience food that is good? Well, there's so many more coming onto the market now, but, the, but then with the, the price can be an issue, and there's, there's no getting away from that. So learning to cook some of these things for yourself, one of the things that I'm always in favour of is batch cooking. So even yeah. if you can spare a couple of hours on a Sunday, cook a vat of something simple like a, like a, a curry or a chilli or something Stew. like that. Stews. Freeze it in individual portions, then you start to stockpile your freezer with your own ready meals. You know what's in it. Guarantee you will save a vast amount of money. And you'll save yourself some time as well. You were vegan for a long time, weren't you? 20 years. 20 years. So what made you go vegan? Crikey. Um, I went vegan initially for ethical reasons. Because okay. for a long time I was a practicing Buddhist. I got into Buddhism from quite a young age. And was always very much aware of my own actions and, and how that influences the world around me. And like, you know, mm -hmm. our, our connection as being. So the... the the choice that I made was from an ethical one. And for 20 years, I did really well on it. And then at the end of that, I start, you know, my health did start to suffer. And that decision to actually stop being vegan, that was like, that was like an existential crisis. That was a yeah. massive decision to make. That's it took right. a year to make that choice. So, hang on, so, so your health started to suffer, but what made you think it's my diet? Because there must have been a, a point where you I thought know. something's wrong with me. Like, well, knowing what I know, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd already finished my, my nutrition undergrad then. Um, I'd finished my, um, my second undergrad in herbal medicine and stuff. So, yeah, I knew the signs. Yeah. You know, I, I had blood work done and my ESR was through the roof. All my inflammatory mediators were through the roof. My fatty acid ratios were done. For the first time in my life, I started putting on weight. And, 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 I, and I was always, okay, so at the minute, I'm like 11 stone. I used to be nine and a half. I used to be like a bag of pipe cleaners. Do you know what I mean? I was like, yeah. it was a skinny little run. And all of a sudden, I sort of, you know, I was getting up to nearly 14, 15 yeah. stone. I was like, what? Where's you, this come from? Were you feeling lethargic? Very all lethargic. Of that. Everything started to break down. So there was multiple breakdowns. I was like, well, clearly there's, there's, there's something diet related going on here. Mm. Clearly. Um, and so then so you get to the start, point where you're thinking, should I, I start eating meat again? But then at the same time, I started getting the most uncontrollable cravings for me after 20 years. Really? Yeah. You know, I was never tempted by like the, the wafting aroma of a bacon sarnia or anything like that. Yeah. Just all of a sudden came out of nowhere and then I did actually eat some. And so what, what was your first non-vegan meal? A steak. A steak. I bet it was yeah. a good grass-fed steak. I bet it was a good one. It was, yeah, it was. It was a nice one. Although, and to be fair, I still, I still follow a very high plant-based diet. I well, can I still go weeks say, without... I've noticed from your Instagram feed, yeah. I don't think I've seen you ever post pictures of red meat. Now and again, I think that, you? I mean, you'd have to search for a while. I mean, yeah. I, I do eat a fair bit of fish, but... And when you first ate that steak, did you get stomach upset, having not eaten meat for 20 years? No, I was high as a kite. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Literally, I, I, felt, it, yeah, I, I felt like doing a streak. It was like utopia. And did you... 
I mean, did lots of people get very offended? People who follow you, the, vegans. I. Th the good thing is that started. I, I made that change just as my career started to do that. So I wasn't that known for being plant based. If you're listening to the a, podcast, a Dale's showing an upwards motion. <laughs> His career began to do really well, even better. Yeah, it, it already it, was. Really well, no, it, it took a long time. No, no, no. It took a long time to get it to get it to where it is now. A lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears, yeah. but. There were, there were a few at first, but do you know what I mean? It's up to them. So your, let's talk about your 14 books. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have to go through the contents of all 14 <laughs> of them right now, but are there, uh, so there, there's one you had called The Power of Three, yes. okay? The Three Nutritional Secrets to a Longer, Healthier Life. Yes. Um, what are those three secrets for those who oh. haven't read the book? Okay, I mean, don't, don't, don't be too fixated on it being like the ultimate answer because there okay. is an ultimate answer. For anyone, that study nutrition in depth. But anyone that's actually taken it to quite a high academic level, the one thing we realize is that we know absolutely nothing. You know, the one thing we're acutely aware of is how little we know about the subject. And it, a question I get all the time, and I should imagine it's something that you hear being a journalist, what is the ideal diet? It's like, mm -hmm. okay, with all this misinformation, what should we be doing? What is the right yeah. thing? And my answer is always, I haven't got a clue. I'd love to be able to tell you, but I've really got no idea. But what we do know is the way in which our modern diet is killing us. We understand a lot about how our modern way of living is damaging our health. So if we flip that on its head and do the opposite, then we're probably starting to hedge our bets. It's absolutely guaranteed that we've not ticked all the boxes because mm -hmm. we don't know what all those boxes are. But we're probably starting in a good place. And you can kind of put that into three distinct areas. You can, you can build it into three pillars, if you like. So blood sugar balance, fatty acid balance, and nutrient density. Now, to really go down the rabbit hole with each of those, we'd need about four hours. But... Blood sugar balance, uh, blood sugar gets out of control, it can increase weight gain, it can increase um, cholesterol, blood pressure, um, inflammatory markers, stress markers, all of those kind of things. Just from eating a high glycemic diet and too many refined carbohydrates, you can put on weight, your risk of type 2 diabetes goes up, your, your um, cardiovascular disease risk goes mm -hmm. up. Fatty acid balance, too much of the wrong kinds of fats, you're in a lot of trouble. Too much omega-6, not enough omega-3, you're going to be stimulating the production of pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. Mm -hmm. Prostaglandins are communication compounds that regulate several responses in the body, the main one being the inflammatory response. Different fatty acids turn into different prostaglandins. If you're taking too many of the wrong types of fatty acids, you start to produce prostaglandins that switch on inflammation. And long-term, inflammatory changes in tissues have been related to many degenerative diseases, like cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease and the instigation of certain types of cancer. That's not sensationalist. Mm -hmm. That's in any GCSE biology textbook. Prolonged inflammation can activate certain genes and tissues that affect cell replication. So that's a serious issue. And then the third, the third of those three things is nutrient density. We're following a diet in modern times that's quite devoid of micronutrients, particularly with a fo focus on highly processed mm. convenience foods. And the micronutrients are the vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and the phytochemicals could come into that as well. And you think what vitamins and minerals are, they're biochemical facilitators. So those things either make something happen or they make something that makes something happen. So if you start to get to a point where you're not taking in enough of some of these key nutrients, your long-term health can be very, very severely affected. So in order for all of us to act on those three secrets, the first blood sugar balance would be, I mean, would you advocate eating little and often or would you just advocate eating things that are slow burners, slow like burners. complex carbs, yep. uh, bit of protein, healthy fats? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's several parts to this. The first part is the kind of carbohydrate staples that you, that you opt for. So your breads, your pastas, your rice, that kind of stuff. Always go for the multigrain version. I mean, you know, that's the basics. Everyone's probably heard of that. The multigrain version, there's more fiber in there because there's more fiber. It takes longer to digest. Because it takes longer to digest, it takes longer to liberate the sugars that are bound to that fiber, mm. which means your blood sugar is drip fed rather than carpet bond. Mm. And then you can just release insulin little and often. The insulin tells the cells there's glucose available. The cell takes it up. Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, everything's fine. That's the first part. Second part is reduce the portion size that you normally have of those starchy carbohydrates. Start to reduce it down a little bit. And instead, bulk out your plate with non-starchy vegetables and good quality proteins. Mm -hmm. So every time you look at a plate, think, where's my protein? So for vegans, that could be things like you know, tofu, pulses, tempeh. For everyone else, that's, that's your, your meats, your fish, yeah. your poultry, eggs, those kinds of things. And with, your, and with the second 
point on fat balance. Right. So, um, That's a very easy one to So address. omega threes are the goodies, yeah. and omega sixes. Where where are we going to find those that we want to avoid? We want well, to avoid the thing is, of both of them are essential. Okay. Both of them are absolutely essential, but it's the amount that we need in in any given period that's the issue. So. Omega-6, we need in a very, very small amount. That small amount goes down one specific uh, biochemical pathway and gets converted into to substances that support neurological health and hormonal health. Absolutely vital. But we only need a tiny amount every single day, and that pathway is very easily saturated. And as soon as that pathway gets saturated, any additional omega-6 that comes in will get put down a different pathway that actually creates these pro-inflammatory oh, prostaglandins. Okay. And unless you're doing something really, really weird, just by... You know, having a, a wide variety of fruit and veg, you're getting enough of those mm-hmm. omega sixes per day to satisfy that pathway, to satisfy our needs. The excess comes in from all of the refined vegetable oils. For years, we were told that things like saturated fat were the devil. We yeah. need to avoid them at all costs. And we should all eat yeah. margarine. It, exactly, or the yeah. heart healthy vegetable oils. They're pure omega six. Mm. And then you look at you look at the graph of like. I mean, this is World Health Organization data as well. It's not like you know some yeah. some trial done down the local chip shop. It's like like massive, massive scale uh, yeah. study size. As that those public health campaigns were actually followed. I mean, I should imagine the same spoke to you about this as well. Yeah, as people yeah. start to follow those um, guidelines of reducing saturated fat and moving over to the heart healthy vegetable oils, cardiovascular disease incidents went up like that because mm. they were eating more starch and more omega-6 rich oils. So the simple thing to do is when, when you cook, there's only two oils to cook with. Olive oil, because the predominant fatty acid in that is a layer acid, which is omega-9, and that doesn't upset the balance at mm. all. And coconut oil. So you cook in, in olive oil, that's really interesting, because yes. I stopped cooking in olive oil, because I heard that it was really bad, and it, and it would oxidise, and if you cook and you heat it at a high heat, it's going to be really bad, and, and bad, and just Extra virgin olive not oil, good. There's, a, there's a very high polyphenol content, so that, that protects uh, a lot of the oxidise from a lot of excess oxidation. Yeah. If you take it, that's why I say two oils though. I mean, olive oil is okay for any kind of stove top stuff. So your general sauteing, stir frying, anything like that. Olive oil is absolutely fine. For very high temperature stuff over long periods of time, like roasting mm. at very high temperatures, then it can start to denature a little bit. That's where you use your coconut oil. Mm. Because with coconut oil, there's no unsaturated fatty acids in there so you don't get damage to the molecule. Yeah, I do use coconut oil yeah. for that. I mean, um, coconut oil isn't this panacea everyone's making it out to be, by the way, but it, it's, it's good for that for that reason. Yeah, it's been a divisive issue recently. Well, <laughs> coconut oil, it has, hasn't yeah. it? Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about you, and uh, rather than going on about coconut oil, but I know no. what a big issue you mean. So, um, are there some foods that you just would not touch with a barge pole? That, like, they are your massively avoid foods? The... Um, well-known sort of fast food outlets. I, I, okay. I wouldn't, the only time I would grace their doorstep is to use the loo. Uh-huh. Uh, so that, that would be one big one. Um, that's pretty much it. The only other things I avoid is because I don't like the taste of it particularly. Oh. I mean, steamed cauliflower, I think, is, is the devil's food. But when, oh, you, when you roast it, oh, roast it roast it off. That's, that's a different, yeah. different story. I like, get some spices with it. You know what, we didn't touch on the third point of the three principles of nutrition. We did touch on it, but what yeah. we didn't do is, is how to act on it. And I guess nutrient density, the message is you just got just to eat more nutrient fresh dense yeah. food. Even if it's as simple as having a good dense side salad with every meal. Something yeah. as simple as that is a start. Um, so you, we discussed the whole um, importance of fat just there, and there is a movement at the moment, I guess you could call it a movement, of a more uh, high-fat, low-carb way mm. of eating. What are your thoughts on that? Because there are some great success stories of people claiming to have reversed type 2 diabetes, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's going low-carb, and then there's a bit of a row with some other health experts who don't quite advocate the high fat diet yet and um, where, where do you stand on that if you use it in a clinical setting for someone that's got serious metabolic issues then it can work miracles and especially in the context of things like type 2 diabetes or anyone that's showing that that kind of triad of issues that we would call metabolic syndrome okay. so mm-hmm. raised cardiovascular disease risk markers like high cholesterol particularly LDL um, small particle size LDL high blood pressure centralized obesity and type 2 diabetes anyone that's displaying those kinds of things it can work wonders long term there's not been enough long term studies to really say one way or the other like what the safety record is because it's not been around long enough I mean obviously things like banting and those kind Mm. of approaches have been around a long time 
but in terms of actual studies on the long-term effects, we don't know. I do want, sometimes worry about the amount of arachidonic acid that's in that diet. So arachidonic acid is, right, let's step back a little bit to the omega-6. Okay. One of the, when I spoke about the omega-6, when it comes into that one pathway, that, you know, that, that, that can get does a favor, favorable thing, yeah. it's fine. But once that pathway gets overloaded, the next thing that the omega-6 fatty acids get converted into is something called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic mm -hmm. acid then converts into a series two prostaglandin, which exacerbates inflammation. A lot of animal fats contain a very high level of, of arachidonic acid. So I do sometimes wonder about its influence on inflammatory load and these kind of things. But you know yeah. what, these, the thing is you can tie yourself in knots with nutrition whichever way you turn. Mm. And there's always question marks, which goes back to my point that we realize how little we actually know. But I think this is an important time to actually say that with all of these different approaches that are out there, okay, so you look whether it's low carb, high fat, whether it's paleo, whether it's a raw food diet, a macrobiotic diet, yeah. a vegan diet, all of them are associated with these massive health transformations. You always see people that have followed them that have really turned their health around yeah. and really and they can, be really, they can be really surprising diets. Yeah. I had Michaela Peterson on a few yeah. weeks ago who only eats beef yeah. and says it's cured all of her autoimmune disorder symptoms. Yeah. Um, but w were you about to say you think there's a common theme? With well, this, this is the thing. Like, even though they're vastly different, there's one common theme that they all share. There's one single thing that all of them share. And this is probably where the truth lies. And any idea what that might be? Uh, will it have something to do with the elimination of stuff we shouldn't be eating? They all cut out the rubbish that's making us sick in the first place. This so is it's just the, the junk rubbish? Yes, they all cut out the rubbish that makes us sick in the first place. So that's the place to start. Uh, if you're watching us live on Facebook, hello, welcome. Uh, we are recording Health Hackers episode 20. This is Dale Pinnock, if you don't already know, the medicinal chef. He's written 14 books about healthy eating. So he knows what he's talking about. We're talking all things healthy eating. If you've got a question, pop it in the comment section below and I can chat to Dale about your comments. Um, right, I've got a few little little questions that okay. can be fairly quick fire if you like. People who follow your work will know you're a big fan of phytochemicals. Yes. Uh, what are they and why are they a big deal? Phytochemicals chemicals are chemicals that naturally occur in plants that can regulate everything from growth cycles, hormone release, or give color pigments, or be part of the, the structure of a plant. They're not essential nutrients, so they're not like vitamins and minerals, you can't be deficient in them, but what we've realized is most of them, can, a lot of them can interact with our physiology, often in a way that is pharmacological, really, if you've ever been near a stinging really? nettle. Yeah. You know, you know that a plant, and the chemistry of that plant, can, influ can interact with your physiology and instigate a response. And that's the whole basis that things like herbal medicine are built on. I mean, not like the kind of traditional things that are based on energetics, but modern herbalism and phytotherapy like they practice in Europe particularly, yeah. are, are built on. These things are essentially pharmacological agents. So we should try and eat as many of them as yeah, we can? Yeah, I mean, most of the antioxidants. How would you so include them in your cooking? The more colours, the better. And the right. more variety of plant-derived foods, the better. Uh, we've got a question from Mike. Okay. Uh, what do you make of all this scientific evidence that keeps telling people that certain foods aren't good for you, and then a few years later, their minds have changed, i.e. red wine and eggs? And I guess oh. we've already highlighted yeah. margarine and yeah. butter and the row over what's good for you there. Well, Mike, this is a great question because it is... This is, this is one of the biggest problems that I have, is I, I do spend a lot of my time actually addressing a lot of these kind of things. Yeah. We have to remember, and you know, I, 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 I say this cautiously, when studies are published and news of a study's finding comes out, sometimes news outlets can grab onto the headline yeah. and report the headline rather than looking into the deeper issue, mm -hmm. because it can be a compelling headline. If a study has found that something is like you know potentially linked to disease, then it's a juicy headline, mm. and news yeah, outlets yeah. do do grab onto it. But the thing is, you have to look at so many of the variables. Go back to the original data. How big was the study group? What actual design was used in designing the trial? Who was funding the trial? All well, of these kind of things. Biggie, Where was it, it published? Who was funding the trial? Yeah. That's become a talking. You know, if it was in like the International Journal of Goat Herding, then maybe it's not got as much. Wait. impact yeah. as it, like something that was in JAMA or the BMJ so yeah. you know all of the, all of these issues are there but also the thing is Mike this it is a really really frustrating subject to, to, to actually study because it's very hard to do a, a double blind randomized placebo control trial on broccoli 
Well, yeah. You're either eating it or you're not. Yeah, and also, who's yeah. going to fund that? Exactly. Diagnostic criteria changes ra rapidly, so our ability to be able to detect physiological changes that can indicate disease state is accelerating all the time. So our ability to actually glean key information from a study will change all the time. Yeah. There's so many variables, and that is what makes nutrition frustrating. And that's why, you know, I raised that point early on that whenever I'm asked what's the ideal diet, my answer is I haven't got a clue because mm. we just can't say that. What we can say is we know how our modern diet is is damaging our health. So maybe let's do the opposite and start building key information around around that because that's the only thing we've really got any clarity on. Mm. You've given me a whole new perspective for every guest I ever have on the show now who suggests that their diet is is the best way. Yeah, it's going to be thinking of you saying. Ah, do you know what I mean? don't I, think I was, it is. So I would love to be able to say that. I'd love yeah. to. I'd, I'd love to stand up. But I'm I'm not here for my ego. Do you know what I mean? I'm here to actually give the best information that I can. I feel absolute responsibility to give the best information if I can. If I don't know something, I'll say that I don't know it and that we haven't got the answers because, you know, what's well, the point? I'm loving that honesty. So back to our quick fire round. Yes. Do you take supplements? Loads. Which ones do you <laughs> I? Say, I, I take a multivit. Yeah. And I, I always think that a multivit's a good idea because you can't guarantee the micronutrient or um, composition of food. Okay. You know, I mean, eat a good diet. Nothing will replace a good diet ever, ever, ever. Yeah. But a good multivitamin, it just kind of covers those bases to make sure that you're hitting like all of your RDAs. I take omega-3 because I'm really about yeah. like, creating that omega-3, omega-6 balance. I do take uh, a B complex because I have the most ridiculous schedule in the world. I, I'm, I'm up at five, I go to bed at like God knows a clock, I'm on the road a lot, I travel You've overseas energy, all the time. So these B-sucks are Well yeah, but the thing is it's, it's a dog. diet and, yeah. and all of that kind of stuff and I love coffee. Um, I take vitamin C as well sometimes, mm. but it's usually when I've, you know, if I've been on the road, if I've, you know, just come off of a flight or something, I'll take a little yeah. bit of extra vitamin C. And that's about it. I've got loads of other stuff in my um, in my supplement cupboard. My supplement yeah. cupboard is like is like a health food I, store. I've got a supplement cupboard. But I just as kind well. of grab things as I'm yeah. on the media. Maybe a little yeah. bit of extra zinc if it feels myself coming down with something. Mm. But my advice to people is like, if if you're thinking about supplements. The basics that you could take every day would be a good quality multi and omega-3. Anything else, anything else, any question marks, speak to someone that knows what they're doing, speak to a practitioner because there's an assumption that just because it's it's, it's natural or it's a nutrient, yeah. that it, it can be harmless. That could not be further from I know, the truth. Well, some of them have got a lot of binding and a lot of fillers in, haven't they? And it's I mean, to be fair, they're probably the most benign things. I mean, it's, it, the, the, the worst part of it is like by taking high doses of certain nutrients, there's mm. toxicity issues potentially yeah, with some. Yeah. There's the ability to actually create false deficiency signs in others or affect the metabolism and excretion of others. So it, it does become a real maze. You can OD on vitamins as well. Yeah. I mean, so there was one point uh, when I was about 18 where I had read how good carrot juice could be for skin. <laughs> I, know, I know what's coming. I, I, I turned orange. I did turn orange. That's called hyperkeratinemia. It was, it was embarrassing. Yes, yeah, because the carotenoids, they're, they're fat-soluble <laughs> nutrients. They naturally migrate into the subcutaneous layer of the skin and they will actually accumulate in the subcutis. Maybe this explains Love Island, I don't know. Ah. It, like, it does give people that kind of orange tinge, doesn't it? But uh, what, but what was really embarrassing is that the most, the most intense orange appeared on the uh, palms of my hands, the soles of my yes. feet, and my upper lip. So, so you look like you had like a really bad like, <laughs> fake tan incident. I had this orange upper lip and palms of my hands. And then I thought, oh my God, it's the carrot juice. I'm going to stop. So They'll be casting me for drunk. Snog Mario Void, <laughs> wouldn't they? Really? <laughs> I've not drunk carrot juice since. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, right. Next question. Intermittent fasting. Massive it, fan. It really? Yeah. Dale, give me some advice. Because I, I can do 12 hours between dinner and breakfast. If I try and go for longer, I just get moody and grumpy. I don't do I don't I don't do longer. What I do is uh, when I get up, I'll, I'll I'll have a cup of coffee. I usually wake up about five. I'll do uh, an hour or so in. Dale's watch. Sorry, is my my watch. Dale's rang. watch is talking. He's a yeah, busy man. My watch rang. Um, I'll do like a couple of hours work. I usually like brainstorming first thing. Yeah. So I'll have a coffee, get into that, then go to the gym and I'll train fasted. Uh -huh. Then I'll have my first meal around about. 11 30 12 and then my last one at about 7 p.m right. and then repeat that the next day that's enough i mean that going a whole day without eating you would not want to be around me oh no, like, no i'd be like you know hangry anderson yeah yeah it wouldn't be good because i don't drink coffee so 
in the mornings then I'm, I'm I don't have any fuel if I was going to find the No, I don't do any caffeine. Really? I quit oh. all caffeine when I was having anxiety. Yeah. Like you know, I mean, I could try bringing it back, but I, I don't know whether that's a good thing. I'll try it if it, if it <laughs> be like does a rocket. Then, yeah. Um, a question from Eve. She's talking about it being pumpkin time of year. You're a fan of seasonal eating. Does seasonal eating really matter? Well, I'm, I'm Does not, our body know the difference? No, no, I'm not. I'm not a fan of seasonal eating. I, th I, th I just like to celebrate seasonal produce, just oh, okay. because it's the season, and also it supports growers in this country. And I like supporting independent businesses and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's got nothing to do with health, really. It's just like these amazing kind of independent artisan businesses. Let's support them. Let's you know support people that aren't oh, a massive chain. I don't know, I don't think the body's got, got, got a clue because we break it down into all its individual components and providing everything's being met and all yeah. the nutritional needs are being met, it, it, it doesn't care one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, have you got any good pumpkin related recipes for oh, I love pumpkin purees. Oh. So for things like, so if, if you have something like particularly salmon, pan fried salmon oh, with write spiced, this down, Eve. spiced pumpkin puree and garlic greens, Ooh. that could be amazing. Pumpkin soup with ginger, goji berries, a little bit of chilli and a tiny bit of cinnamon. That is off the charts. Will you send me the, the recipes for both of those? I will, and I will. I'll put it in the show notes, everybody, so you can have sal uh, salmon with yeah. pumpkin puree. Um, well, one of my favourite things, just lumps of pumpkin, roasted up, with rocket, a little bit of feta cheese, walnuts, balsamic dressing. Feta cheese. Amazing. I'm allergic to nuts, but I'll take the cheese. Yeah. That'd be great. Um, all right, Dale, we're up on time, but before you go, I really want people to know where they can find out more about you what are you on social media so social media on instagram just at the medicinal chef facebook just the medicinal chef twitter i'm coming off it i don't bother it's no just, way really yeah it's it, it's it's just a vitriolic hellhole i can't stand it a lot it. of people do well on twitter um, oh, yeah wow. so i'm coming off I don't, I don't go on there i don't use it so i'm not gonna bother so those are the two instagram and facebook and then my main website is just dalepinnock.com Excellent. I'll put all these in the show notes, everybody. Eve says yum to that recipe, by the way. Uh, are we going to see you on TV anytime soon? Because Dale uh, does loads of TV. That's probably where you recognise him from if you're watching the Facebook Live. But if it was that crime watch incident. <laughs> uh, no, the, so Series 2 of Eat Shop Safe finished in August. Ho hopefully we get Series 3. But yeah, I'll pop up on other things as well. We always um, see. Brilliant. And yeah, you're okay. spreading such a good message. Thank and it's you. really refreshing to talk to you. Thank you. Um, Dale Pinnock, thank you. And thank you everybody for watching Thanks live on Facebook. Bye-bye.